Good afternoon or evening for those joining abroad. I appreciate the opportunity to join the 2021 CopraCon conference and to share some thoughts about a stakeholder engagement in research and based on my work with community partners and ongoing learning really since 1996. Our work has been funded by the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute or PCORI by NIMH and by institutional funding. For the next 35 minutes, I'm going to summarize what we know in terms of the benefits, pros and cons of a participatory approach to pragmatic trials, a proposed new lens as context dependent engagement, a brief overview of implementation strategies, a few tips on grant proposals, and I will conclude in the spirit of inclusion by sharing the views on the matter from four research partners that I admire and that I have the privilege to work with. And with that, I'm going to jump right in. This is a busy agenda. Let's first consider why should we engage a diverse group of stakeholders in our research and implementation efforts. There are many reasons, but three stand up. First, when we include the views and experiences of those individuals in real life settings, those managing complex systems, leading policy, and those individuals benefiting from evidence-based practices, the information that we gather on every aspect of the research process from proposal development to intervention testing and implementation is going to be comprehensive, is going to capture real time changes in local context, and is going to um, foster a sense of ownership and empowerment among those involved. Second, the active engagement of those delivering the evidence-based practices and end users, such as patients, caregivers, consumers, community members, paves the way for faster translation of evidence into routine practice. Last, when we open research spaces to individuals who have not had a seat at the table or not enough, or not in a meaningful way, we provide a platform to get their voices heard and for them to also be part of the design, development, testing, and implementation of evidence-based practices. So what do we know about a stakeholder engagement in research studies seeking to test interventions in real or real life or usual settings. Systematic literature reviews for the past seven years have emphasized the benefits of community-based participatory research principles. Those principles emphasize the need to support communities identifying and prioritizing their concerns and places an emphasis in longer term partnerships. There is also literature review has also um, shown the benefits of engaging our stakeholders in all phases of the research process. There is also a need to set aside human and um, financial resources, focusing specifically on the collaborative process, on the engagement process. Most importantly, the need for tracking and evaluating, evaluating the engagement process and linked outcomes, I will add. And how have we, how, what have we learned in terms of challenges to engagement during, the, during a pragmatic trial? Well, we still lack evidence on what type of this engagement method works best for certain communities in certain areas of research 
and in which local context. We still need to do a better job at tracking our activities and outcomes and establishing universal engagement reporting guidelines. There is also variation on when do we engage our, are we engaging our stakeholders? And that makes it difficult to evaluate across the studies and learn from one another. Most importantly, we might be perpetuating inequities and lack of reciprocity as many studies report engagement of racial and ethnic minorities to obtain access to their communities and to increase recruitment. So how can we think of engagement as a way of addressing those challenges? Well, I propose that by realizing that the goals of pragmatic tri trials and implementation science head on the same direction, they are complementary. We can think of the, these two fields as having three common goals, increased diversity of views and contributions, co-creation during the implementation process, and sustainment of evidence-based practices in real life, real world clinical and community settings. So let's start by highlighting what implementation science, how it can contribute, what can contribute. One contribution is the emphasis on context. We, as implementation scientists, are keen to the importance of context in influencing and even shaping interventions before, during, and after they are delivered in real life settings. Then my question is, how can we create enabling context to promote an engagement process that can successfully reach those three common goals? What will it take for us as researchers, as providers to acknowledge the role of local context on how partnerships are entrusted and maintained? This emphasis on engagement is not new. In fact, notice the evolution of the Medical Research Council or MRC in the UK, their framework on about how we evaluate complex health interventions. Those interventions are multi-level, they might have feedback loops, and they are usually delivered in dynamic and always changing settings, environments. So notice a shift from a more prescriptive approach on the left from 2006 to 2029 to a revised framework in 2019 where stakeholders are at the center of the scientific process and the role of context is permeating every single aspect of the evaluation process. This is exciting. Inclusive, this new lens even formally acknowledges a level of uncertainty on what we do. So I propose we conceptualize engagement as context dependent. Let's consider Thomas Concanon and colleagues on the seven piece of a stakeholder categories. You can see them on my, in my slide as that black and white table. We often engage more than one group as they develop these uh, categories of taxonomy. And we could involve providers, patients, policymakers as a way to promote change at the system and individual levels. I could go on now to give you tips on how to engage each group but I'm not gonna do that. My point is one size does not fit all. My main point is if we know the benefits from the literature, the benefits of a participatory approach that honors stakeholders' needs, values, and priorities. And if we agree that our needs, 
values and priorities are intertwined with our day-to-day -day experiences in our local neighborhoods and communities, then why not envisioning engagement as context-dependent? If we do that, could we embrace a sense of exploration and wonder as a strategy when we engage with local communities, with those groups that you see at the bottom that might be highly influenced and dependent on local context, patients, consumers, providers. So we get to know them, we get to know those stakeholders and those communities we care about. Could then we embrace and strengthen broad and diverse networks as a way to engage, let's say, developers and policymakers and meet their needs to disseminate and sustain change? One size does not fit all. Here is one area where implementation science can be incredibly helpful. Implementation strategies have been defined by colleagues as systematic processes or methods, techniques, activities, or resources that we put in place to support the adoption, integration, and sustainment of evidence-based, evidence-informed practices or interventions in your usual settings. That is key. They should be theory-based. They should be feasible. If not, why are, we, why are we bothering? So they should be concrete enough so we can define them and we can evaluate them. Think of it as a single activity, like consultation, for example, or a combination of single activities or strategies, like the use of technology and consultation. The field of implementation science has developed an impressive number of strategies that have been tested in numerous settings, populations, and contexts. Thomas Waltz at at Eastern Michigan University and his colleagues in 2015 used concept mapping to classify the expert recommendations for implementation change or ERIC list. The ERIC list is a list, a longer list of strategies that we implementers use very often to select um, and support the evidence-based practices. One category that emerged from um, this study from Waltz and colleagues' study relates to those strategies designed to further relationships across agencies and or stakeholders. I propose we pay attention to these type of strategies to guide our engagement efforts. Oh, here we are. Here is a list of the concrete activities or strategies under this category, broader umbrella or category to give you an idea. As you can see, the list is comprehensive and varied. One size does not fit all. You can find more information on the citations that I'm providing at the end of my presentation. But tested strategies are merely the wheels. What gets them in motion is our investment in time, self-reflection, and resources to promote cultural humility, co-creation, and an engagement process that responds to each community's way of doing things and that offers transparency on what is done why is done and when will be done. And we can reflect our relationships, engagement process in reading proposals and manuscripts. I'm sharing just a few pointers here as this can take a full session. 
make sure those relationships are already in place well before you start writing your proposal, ideally. Seek input from your stakeholders through listening sessions and focus groups. In fact, we have inserted quotes directly into our grant proposals to carry the voices of our partners directly onto those written pages and for reviewer size. If you haven't already, become more familiar with PCORI's approach to research and funding from a participatory lens. At last, CTSA centers across the United States through universities that have been funded through these um, centers provide, can provide rich information and tools online. I am including two links from university institutions I have worked with, the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and currently the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Okay, so here they are, my top five take home messages on engagement. Number one, think of it as a way to increase research quality. Number two, draw from the field of implementation to include and test the strategies that rely on a stakeholder interrelationships. Number three, if you're looking for partners at the time of your grant proposal writing or to review your drafts, it is too late. You miss the vote, the vote. Number four, time, humility, and meaningful relationships will lead to a stronger data and higher quality of research. And number five, context, I'm sorry, engagement is context dependent. And such, we must tailor strategies to respect and honor the lived experiences of our stakeholders and use our standing as researchers to sponsor opportunities. My best engagement strategies have come down to a good cup of coffee. So for one of the partnerships that projects I have collaborated with, with partners in North Carolina, we just started getting to know each other over a good cup of coffee. Before even talking about research, before going over and ask for a proposal, we just went for coffee and got to know each other better. Not only that, but when I ask my partners, how do we handle conflict before it arises, before it happens, I ask, how should we handle conflict? And their answer was over a good cup of coffee. Let's go for coffee. And we did. I have also enjoyed the, our partnerships when my stakeholders can set the agenda. So they have more control on what we discuss and how. In addition, I have been so delighted and honored to be invited to the table, especially with federally qualified health centers, to sit at the table and listen during their work group meetings, during their, um, uh, we have right now a trauma-informed care work group with one of my partners, and I sit at the table and I learn from them. And before we're ready to move on for a, to, um, through a research project, it can happen after a week or even over a year when they are ready again to identify their own problem and priority so it can bring a diverse interdisciplinary team to answer questions. And of course, we are meeting now through Zoom, as you can see on the right. In addition, I have enjoyed those partnerships where there is a mutual benefit um, and where I have heard or seen the communities benefit. For example, a project with Latinas where as part of the dissemination plan, they proposed and we put it together and we filmed a video and they developed the script as a dissemination strategy. I will learn more about that project in the afternoon uh, in the individual sessions. 
I have enjoyed those partnerships where we avoid making assumptions on one another. At last, I have enjoyed those partnerships where ideas are respected and credit is given. Okay, as I mentioned, I have invited in a way several of my colleagues to be part of this platform of this forum and they have graciously uh, filmed audio recorded their thoughts and their opinions in two questions. What makes a trustful research partner on your view? And I also ask them, how does engagement advance social justice? So each of my partners answer both or one of these questions. You will hear from Luke Smith, who is the director of the only bilingual Spanish and English mental health community clinic in North Carolina. You will hear from two of my colleagues representing each one of the biggest federally qualified health center systems serving over 200,000 patients per year, Melissa Chinchilla at Altamed and Christina Reeves at Borrego Health. And you will hear from Dr. Jones, who is the Vice President of Health and Social Services at one of the leading permanent supportive housing agencies, providing permanent housing to adults with lived experiences of homelessness in Los Angeles County. So I think the first question is, what makes a um, trustful um, relationship, partnered race relationships? I think it's that mutual um, partnered work. And to me, what I think is really valuable are two things. One is, um, you know, being included in every step of the way. So the hypothesis development, designing the proposal, being part of data collection and interpretation, and then being part of dissemination. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important and that partners can, can get out of a true partnered relationship with a researcher or an academic is um, you have someone who has this other set of skills, um, maybe around um, best practices or how to figure things out, has capacity to do something that maybe a health system can't do. And so if you have a true partnership, then that academic or researcher is open to being responsive to the system's needs. So our example is, you know, we came to, to you, Monica, with this question of, you know, like diabetes, what's going on with folks who are having a hard time controlling their, their diabetes? And even though that wasn't a topic you had any experience with, you were open to helping us with what we needed. Um, which was really great and you were able to bring together, you know, a diverse team, um, which included like folks from the Department of Engineering, which we never would have thought or been able to connect with without that partnership that, you know, includes trust and mutual respect for, you know, the institutions we both sit in, which have different motivations for what we do and why we do it. And then I think the second question is about sort of social justice and you know how that can be addressed through um, community engaged partner engaged uh, research and i think that you know this might be a little bit naive or sound kind of pollyanna but it's kind of a space to demonstrate what things could look look like if there were not social and structural inequality. So it's a space to model, you know, sharing resources, respecting people's um, histories, you know, histories of trauma, um, respecting where people come from and how that informs what they do and what they know um, and valuing all of that. Um, and really just modeling what it could look like um, for everyone to sit at the table you know, at the same table. Um, how I think that research then uh, and engagement uh, promotes and, and advances social justice 
is that I see research coming in and um, really lifting everybody, lifting the researcher, the research team, science, and the community and the organization potentially to a new level, a new level of awareness, a, a new level of empowerment, that people get leadership development. And when they have leadership development, that allows them now to, to have new opportunities, perhaps to go ahead and get an education or to understand new concepts that helps them with their family and helps them engage bigger systems and change the systems around them. Um, and then it really does bring new skills to everybody and helps us all learn together and really does become an empowering um, activity that helps with uh, our social justice movement. So here at Ultimate, we really start from the perspective that health is a human right and that ensuring equity of health involves a framework of social justice. And we see community engagement and patient engagement opportunities as a way to promote social justice, really thinking about this as a spectrum in terms of um, what the engagement, what the development of an individual might look like. So for example, a lot of the work that we've been doing has been thinking about how do we first bring in folks, maybe through a patient education lens, maybe through um, a one-time policy advocacy opportunity, how do we bring them into the fold and then begin to engage them in a deeper way. So we're really thinking about how are we building leadership? How are we building capacity to support the growth of individuals within our organization and really providing patients and community members with a seat at the table? Along those lines, we're hoping that uh, patient and community engagement leads to long-term trans community transformation and policy change. So one of the things that we've been focused on is really addressing the social determinants of health. So realizing that um, an individual's health is not only what happens within the clinic setting, but also what happens in their local community. So we've been using community engagement and research as a starting point to think about how can we transform communities, realizing that patient and community engagement is a long-term commitment. And so we're hoping to bring folks along with us through that initial low touch to then encouraging them to get involved in, in uh, leadership development, advocacy efforts, learning what research is and how research can be important to transforming policy using data to really support uh, changes that need to happen at the local level. And then using that training around advocacy and community leadership to push change forward. So good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, one of the questions that was presented to uh, this team is, you know, the question of what makes a, a trustful research partner? Um, and it's a very interesting question because sometimes we often don't think of the complexity of research and working with, with partners um, uh, co-conducting research studies. But I think most importantly, um, when, we, when we think about trustful research partners, you, you have to think about research, researchers who perhaps share the same and similar research interests um, and the ability to conduct research studies with integrity, but also from um, an ethical lens. The other piece of this question that's interesting to me is that we want to make sure that um, the researchers, they, they form a trustful team, meaning that um, the, the, the research study that, um, that that's being conducted, that there's a balance, right? Um, to the extent that um, you build upon one research, you may be have stress in one area, one research you may have weakness in another. So, for example, one of the things that's important is that you always want to make sure you have a, a partner who may be an expert, say, for example, in qualitative research, or the other partner is an expert in mixed method research, which is both quantitative and qualitative um, uh, research. This is a way for, for researchers to really draw upon the scope of both of their practice and research expertise, but also it allows them to formulate cohesive recommendations and conclusions that are meaningful uh, to the research study. Um, more importantly, it also allows uh, the researchers to really um, examine the, the, uh, the, the, the generalized abilities of the study, but also the limitations and so i think that's really important for when we just come together and they they want to conduct research together that they're on the same page but that's how um, i believe that um, 
uh, a trust research partnership um, works. The second part of this question um, was asked, you know, how do we engage or advance social justice? Um, being that, you know, coming from uh, a PhD program that was very much foundational in um, equity and social justice and, and educational leadership, but throughout the K through 12, pre, pre K through 25 line, um, I think it's very important that when you think about um, uh, engagement in, um, in social justice research, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me is participatory engagement that advance um, social justice in three distinct ways. And I think that first way is that, you know, researchers, they really need to be authentic, have some authenticity about themselves, especially when they immerse and engage themselves in research in um, high poverty communities and white nice communities where um, those individual voices have been marginalized or um, they have gone unheard. Um, you want to allow those voices um, descriptively, but also narratively to, to, um, to really, you know, um, to really speak to the, the injustice, but give voice to them, right, to those individuals in the community. The other part of this question um, that I find fascinating is when it comes to social justice um, engagement is the, the notion that there's, there's definitely, if you want to get to this social justice paradigm, you have to be able to debunk definitely notions of race, class, gender, uh, social economic status, religion, and sexuality. And I think one of the ways in order to do that is, you know, to do it from a theoretical framework, um, critical race theory that addresses the intersectionality of, and also other social justice sub issues. Um, the research has to be meaningful and transformative. Um, but more importantly, that it creates a paradigm shift. Um, where we are able to engage participants in meaningful dialogue, but also examine the hegemonic systems and policies that perpetuate these type of inequities. Um, I think that if we're able to do some of these things in distinct ways, um, then we're able to advance um, engagement and advance um, social justice um, in such a meaningful way that it um, that's transformative, right? I hope you enjoy the views and opinions of my colleagues. I have uh, collaborations with each of them from six years to three or four years, so they're a long time. And I appreciate their they kindly sharing their time um, to be part of this platform. References are included in my presentation and you can access, I understand it will be uploaded and I think now it's time for some discussion, questions and answers. Thank you.